Adrian Beltre is one of the greatest third basemen of all time. He hit for a good batting average, smacked nearly 500 career home runs, made four all-star teams, won five silver slugger awards, five gold glove awards, and two platinum glove awards. He was incredible defensively at third base along with the bat and will forever go down as a Texas Rangers legend despite playing for three other teams throughout the course of his 21-year career. Not only was he a great player, but also a great person, full of heart, full of humor, had fun with himself and with his teammates, and was just all around a fun player to watch. There wasn't much controversy, if really at all, during Beltre's long major league career, but it's what happened before his career began that was controversial. In fact, not only was it controversial, but it was illegal. So welcome back to the channel, or welcome if it's your first time. Over 78% of my watch time is from people who aren't subscribed. So if you enjoy the video, hit that button along with the bell for post notifications. It'll make me happy, which is not what Major League Baseball was when finding out about the illegal activities regarding Adrian Beltre. 1999 was going to be Adrian Beltre's first full crack at the big leagues with the team that signed him at 16 years old, the Dodgers. He got his feet wet a little bit the year before, 98, but the expectations were high heading into the 99 season. During spring training that year, Beltre's agent Scott Boris was beyond impressed with his client's rapid rise to the big leagues, saying that he couldn't believe it all and how well he's handled playing such a difficult position like third base at just 20 years old. Beltre then reminded Boris that he was actually 19 years old, not 20, and this sparked some trouble regarding the Dodgers organization. What Scott Boris realized by Beltre telling him that he was 19 was that his date of birth in the Dodgers records was incorrect. The youngest a player can sign with a team in MLB is 16 years old. When the Dodgers signed Beltre on July 7th, 1994, they listed his birthday as April 7th, 1978, when the reality was his birthday was April 7th, 1979. So Beltre was 15. Boris would tell the Dodgers this revelation and ask them to compensate Beltre for signing him at younger than MLB's allowable age. But when team personnel denied the claims, Boris went public with it, with Major League Baseball launching an investigation into the Dodgers. Boris claimed Beltre didn't know he was too young to sign with the Dodgers until March of 1999, but Commissioner Bud Selig shut that claim down, citing five specific documents that Beltre had filled out and signed on which he listed the falsified birth. Date. This included a sports service questionnaire in 1996, two club physical examination questionnaires in 1997 and 1998, and United States Immigration and Naturalization Forms in 1997 and 1998. Selig also referenced the representation Beltre had from his father and an amateur coach when negotiating who he would sign with. By the end of the investigation, Major League Baseball ended up letting the Dodgers keep Beltre, preventing him from becoming a free agent, but also suspended their entire scouting operations in the Dominican Republic for one year along with the two scouts who originally discovered Beltre during a workout at the Dodgers Dominican facility. Beltre was also awarded $48,500 in damages, and with that, off his career officially started moving. In 1999, Beltre's first full season, he was pretty good, a little better in 2000, but from 2001 to 2003, he actually wasn't very good or productive. He had three straight below average seasons offensively, and although he did show some potential, he just wasn't the guy everyone was hyping him up to be leading in the 99. That all changed in 2004. In 2004, his final year before hitting the free agent market for the first time, Adrian Beltre went off, hitting 334 with an OPS over 1,000. He more than doubled his previous career high in home runs with 48, which was the most in all baseball, drove in 121 runs. I mean, just a monster at the plate, finishing second behind Barry Bonds in MVP voting. Perfect time to become a free agent, and it paid off, leaving the Dodgers for Seattle to sign a five-year, $64 million contract with the Mariners and Beltre immediately came back down to earth, having a poor first season as a Mariner in 2005, a better one in 2006 and 2007, but Beltre's time as a Mariner ended up being the most disappointing stretch of his career. Overall, in the five years he spent there, he was a league average hitter, just overall not living up to the expectations the Mariners had from when giving him that contract. With that said, it didn't pass by without at least some stuff happening. It's been well documented that Beltre didn't wear a cup despite playing at the hot corner at third base. In August of 2009, he'd take a hard grounder to the groin, yet stayed in for the entirety of the game, a game that went 14 innings when he scored the winning run, the only run in a 1-0 Mariners win. Unfortunately, the hard grounder to the 
groin was more serious than he treated it, with him soon having to be put on the disabled list because of bleeding in one of his testicles. Ouch. But this actually has a happy full circle moment slash ending to it. When Beltre came back from the injury, Ken Griffey Jr. secretly told the people working for the Mariners Ballpark's public address system to have Beltre's walk-up song be the opening march from the Nutcracker Suite. 2009 was Beltre's last season in Seattle, so this was the last pretty notable thing that happened with him there, which ended up being a pretty good metaphor for his tenure there, baseball to the balls. So after a pretty dreadful 2009 season, Beltre was kind of back to square one. He obviously wasn't getting another big contract, not being valued nearly as high as he was last time he entered the market, and so what he had to do was take a short-term, prove-it kind of deal to show the world that he's still capable of being great, signing a one-year deal with the Boston Red Sox worth $9 million. Going into the 2010 season, Beltre's overall career had been regarded as a disappointment. After finishing the 2010 season, looking ahead to 2011, that narrative completely changed and the hype train was back on. 2010 was the most random and seemingly forgotten part of Beltre's career because it was his first and only year with the Red Sox and he was actually amazing. And without it, he doesn't end up having the legacy he has today. It really shaped up to what was coming. Beltre ended up hitting the most doubles in all of baseball with 49, smacked 28 home runs, led the team in batting average, and tied David Ortiz for the team in RBI becoming an all-star for the first time. This really rejuvenated his career, now being looked at as a pretty premier free agent, and the Rangers treated him that way, giving him a contract worth more than the Mariners did, five years for $80 million. Adrian Beltre's career as a whole is pretty fascinating because when you think of Adrian Beltre, you think of him as a Ranger. At least I think most people do. I definitely do. Despite him playing 13 full seasons with three other organizations before ever putting on a Rangers uniform, it almost seems like he was a lifelong Ranger. When you think of Adrian Beltre, you don't really think of the Dodgers, you don't really think of the Mariners, nobody seems to think about him on the Red Sox, and it's all valid, because Beltre ended up having the most iconic and memorable time in Texas. It's almost as if his time with the Dodgers, Mariners, and Red Sox was all just a prologue to the real Adrian Beltre we all know and love today. Before Texas, he was still building and finding himself as a player, going through ups and downs, getting smacked in the balls, getting called a bust and a disappointment. But after putting on that Rangers uniform, that's when he officially became Adrian. In Beltre. In 2011, Beltre got his first taste of the postseason since 2004, being an integral part of a first place Texas Rangers team that won 96 games. He was actually the best hitter on the team, helping lead the Rangers past the Rays and Tigers in the playoffs. In game four, the ALDS against the Rays, Beltre connected for three home runs. Despite his team coming up barely short in the end in the now iconic 2011 World Series, it wasn't because of Beltre, someone who hit 300 that series, connecting for two home runs, with one of them being a clutch game-tying homer in Game 5, doing so on one knee. By the end of it all, Beltre won his second Silver Slugger Award, his third Gold Glove Award, being rewarded even further for his defense at third base, winning the brand new award MLB started in 2011, the Platinum Glove Award, which is the absolute best defender overall for any position in each league, so only one player in each league wins it. And from this point on, Beltre just continued to roll, becoming an all-star yet again in 2012, hitting 36 more homers, driving in over 100 runs, finished third in MVP voting, won another gold glove, and other platinum glove along with other defensive awards. Adrian Beltre's time with the Rangers is bittersweet to me because he was so good and a part of so many winning teams, but teams that just couldn't make it to the finish line, choking in the end. But it was still a fun time. Seeing him hold the World Series trophy on the field after the Rangers finally won last year was just awesome. He deserves that, even though he's been retired since 2018. That trophy does partially belong to him as far as I'm concerned. In 2015, Beltre hit for the cycle against the Astros, doing so for the third time in his career, one time with the Mariners and two times with the Rangers, with all three of these cycles happening at Globe Life Park, which had never happened before. Beltre even at one point won an award given to him by a fraternity. The dude was just so good they had to start making up random awards to give him. No, but the fraternity Phi Delta Theta presented him with the 2014 Lou Gehrig Award, one that's supposed to represent someone with great character and integrity, which is an ironic award for a fraternity. 
fraternity to give out, but hey, we'll take it. Adrian Belche was actually an awesome dude off the field, contributing in a big way to programs around the Dallas-Fort Worth area, like the Texas Rangers Baseball Foundation, Texas Rangers RBI program, the I Love Baseball program, which operates in the Dominican Republic, the Baseball Tomorrow Fund, and others. He was awesome off the field and on the field, also being awesome on the field when not playing. Beltre was always such a goofy person, always messing around with everyone, even the umpires. Late in the game, after umpire Jerry Davis asked Beltre to move closer to the on-deck circle, Beltre went and picked up the on-deck circle and moved it to where he originally was, with Davis ejecting him because he has no sense of humor. Another umpire, a long-time one who's also now retired, Joe West, called Adrian Beltre the biggest complainer in baseball, eventually getting suspended for three games by the league because of these comments. Now, this could have been taken out of context as Wes did clarify that he and Beltre are friendly, with Beltre himself even saying that Wes was probably joking when he said that because the two joke around. Beltre messed with the opposing players and his teammates, most notably Elvis Andrews, a young shortstop who played alongside Beltre the entire time he was in Texas. I mean, there should have been an entire reality TV show on the friendship between these two. It was such a big brother, little brother relationship, and it was awesome. Beltre always played the funny role, the older, wiser big brother, having to put up with a younger and dumber, more immature Andrews, someone who would literally go out of his way to mess with Beltre in the middle of plays. It was amazing. Beltre also had this thing where he didn't want anyone to touch his head, so of course after a home run or something, Andrews would touch his head. Watch, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> The man couldn't even take himself seriously when getting the call that he was being inducted into the Hall of Fame, trolling everyone, including his family, that he wasn't going to answer the phone. Cooperstown, New York! <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Answer it. So now I'm gonna leave it. Go to the Answer it! <laughs> <laughs> He'd also make a habit of hitting home runs on one knee, making that his signature thing, and in 2017, he'd get hit number 3,000, making him the 31st player in history to reach that milestone, and the first ever Dominican-born player to accomplish that. That's pretty cool. And in 2018, he'd go on to become the all-time leader in hits for a player not born in the United States, going on to retire after the season. Skip ahead about five years later, now January of 2024, and after officially being put on the Hall of Fame ballot for the first time, as you get put on five Five years after retirement, the voters wasted no time getting Adrian Beltre in, with him justifiably now becoming a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's expected to go in with a Red Sox hat on his plaque actually, which is surprising. I'm just kidding, he's going in as a Texas Ranger because obviously, although I'm sure at least some of you believe me for a second, and it's just the perfect cherry on top to a brilliant career. One that started out in an illegal way, getting signed by the Dodgers at just 15 years old before the legal age a team can even sign a player, and despite the struggles, the ups and downs, being doubted and looked down on as a bust, and even getting a bleeding testicle. I mean, who gets a baseball to the balls and then not only stays in the game for all 14 innings, but scores the winning run? Who else has ever done that? Exactly, his career was nowhere near perfect, but he ended up figuring it all out by the end, cementing himself as one of the best third basemen of all time. Adrian Beltre is one of the toughest hitters, one of the most skilled defenders, and has the strongest balls of all time. That sure is Hall of Fame worthy.